Thank you very much. Sergio Kosherington. Again. My name is Sergio Corgan. I am from Eugene, Oregon. After early graduating from high school at the age of 17, I joined the United States Marine Corps. My intentions were to defend my country from all the enemies, foreign or domestic. Upon completion of my training, I was assigned to the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, 1st Marine Division, 29 Palms, California. At which point, I, was, I served two deployments in Iraq, first from uh, February of 2003 through November of 2003 with 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, Alpha Company, 3rd Platoon. My second deployment was from August 2004 through March 2005 with 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, Scout Sniper Platoon. First, I will begin with the entry into Baghdad District. As we cleared all the buildings and moved into the city, and we finally had a time to take a little break. We found a lot of left behind vehicles from pickup trucks all the way to luxury Toyota Avalons with leather and sunroofs, which we used for per perimeter patrolling. The pickup trucks and the other vehicles were used for the car derby. We would either ram into each other or just ram into the walls while the Iraqi people watched us and were asking for vehicles. We knew they were going to loot the cars, so we just destroyed them so that the people would not have a chance to take them except for the scraps. We also were exposed to a lot of dead Iraqi citizens, either enemy combatants or innocent civilians who were killed by initial airstrikes or invasion. At one point, after approaching the dead bodies of about four people, we began to take pictures and trying to move and flip them over to try to identify them as civilians or enemy combatants. A few days later, a family of the killed came by and asked if we find anyone who was killed nearby. Me and another Marine led the family to the dead corpse, and they were identified as their sons and uncles and nephews of the family. It was very hard to see the pain in the people's eyes from their loss. They began to cry and point at us and at the sky and telling us that the planes killed them and it was our fault also, but we tried to explain to them that it wasn't us. While serving in Najaf, the only humanitarian work that we did was painting a park for kids, which one of the platoons did for a week or two, and after, after that we did not do any humanitarian work until we left. The other incident that I want to mention in Al Najaf was concerning Al Sider, uh, who is in charge of the largest militia in Iraq. Our unit was assigned to prepare a task force to arrest Al Sader to prevent other clashes between U.S. forces and Sader's militia. We spent a great amount of time on training to prepare for the raid. After the months of training and preparing, the mission was canceled. Nobody gave us any reasons why the operation did not go through. Imam Ali Mosque in Al Najaf, Iraq. An influential Shiite cleric, Ayatollah Muhammad Bakir al Hakim, was killed with other 122 innocent people on August 30th, 2003. Few of our Marines went to the hospital to provide security for all the relatives that were trying to con contact their families. When they came back, they said they have never seen so much blood before. They said that they couldn't even see the ground, so much blood and pipe parts were everywhere. The suicide bombing, bombing was placed by Al-Hakim's political and religious opponent, Al-Sadr. A no number of attacks have been organized by Al-Sadr's militia against innocent people of Iraq and against the occupying forces. One other responsibility we, has, we had in Al-Najaf was to guard an ammunition supply point about 30 miles northeast from our base. Our job consisted of patrolling ASP, and when we came into contact with the Iraqis stealing stuff, we would take a physical action and to make sure they would never come back. We would, we would shoot their tires out or shoot their windows, putting them on their knees like we were about to execute them and just shoot in the air and laugh and yell at them and tell them that the next time it would be worse. Our orders directly from command was to roughen up all the guys up. They would always tell us that everybody is an enemy and that we can't trust them and the only way to keep them in place is to put, put as much fear as possible and to let them know that we're not playing around. During the deployment in Al Najaf, nothing was fixed or intended on being fixed at all except keeping the city in occupied hands and instill the fear into the people at every chance we got. My second deployment was in the city of Huseiba, an Al Anbar province in Al Qaim region on the Syrian border. First thing I want to talk about is the drop weapons. Drop weapons are the weapons that are given to us by our chain of command in case we kill somebody without any weapons and so that we would not get into trouble we would carry an AK-47 and if the person that was shot did not have the weapon an AK-47 would be placed at his corpse and when the unit would come back to the base they would turn it in to identify the shot man as the enemy combatant. The weapons could not come from anywhere else but the higher chain of command because after the raid all the weapons were turned in into the armory and should have been recorded. Two months into deployment, our rules of engagement changed.
to a personnel with having a bag and a shovel at the intersection or on the roads that they were suspicious. This gave us a bigger window on who we can engage. Looking at the situation, this point of view, a lot of enemy combatants that we shot were in the wrong place at the wrong time. We were tired, mad, angry, and we just wanted to go home and stop at the killing of our brothers. One of our intelligence officers told us that they received a call from one of the sources in the city telling them that there are flyers posted all over the town that says that there are unknown snipers in the city that kill the insurgents and the civilians. We did not take into consideration that the innocent people are being killed by us because every time we sent the pictures to the command post through the interlink system, we would receive an approval to kill people with shovels in the bags. Now, I know that it wasn't right to do that, but when you trust those who act like they care for you, you listen to them and follow their orders because you don't want to let your friends down. What if was used as a propaganda and a way to relieve our minds from the actions we have partaken in and make it easier on us? Another thing I want to touch on is problems with equipment are another big problem. Where is all the money going that is given to the military? During my first deployment, I had a Vietnam-era flag jacket without a plate. My M16 was made back in the late 70s. We did not have enough night vision goggles for everyone. While Marines are patrolling in the Hummers every day and get blown up because the only protection they have are the flag blankets hanging from the doors, while generals and colonels and other high-ranking officers that leave a base once in a while have a brand new fully armored Hummers that are always spotless clean sitting on the base while other Hummers are bleeding with our brothers, sons, daughters, sisters' blood every day. When we all come back from Iraq and we see, seek help from our command, they call us weak and cowards. The lines for psychologists almost a year long, and the only thing that can help us is the alcohol and the prescription pills that are giving out to us like candy to keep us down. Because it seems like doctors don't want to do their job and they just don't care. Use of drugs among, amongst the military units is critical. We lost the numerous numbers of people from failing drug tests. They either want to get out or they're just so messed up, and the, the only one thing that can help them is to escape is the drugs. The last thing I want to tell you is about a roommate who we shared a bathroom with, a Marine who was on the suicide watch for about a few, few months on and off. The last three weeks before we were deployed, he was constantly on watch. A week before a family day when the family comes in and says goodbye to their Marines before we deployed, he was released from the watch so that he would not say anything to his parents and he did not say anything to them. About a month into deployment, he blew his brains out in the shower stall. Actions like that show the poor judgment of our, of our command just to have numbers for the troops and just to keep their own skin safe. The Marines should have never gone to Iraq in the first place, and nobody was held responsible for his death. If there is no care for your own Marines, what care do they have for the people of Iraq when they give the orders? I want to thank you for your time, and I, I believe that you will make a right decision and will help us to stop this inhumane treatment of Iraqi people and the troop and stop occupation of Iraq and help us to bring troops home. Thank you. Luis. Yes, uh, esteemed Congress.